Primary studies, people going into the field and doing rigorous impact evaluations. And so Anami Mertens will be presenting um, the first study, which is um, on agricultural extension in Malawi. Um, and then we have the, the Daniel Phillips um, and Sri Harini Narayanan, um, who are go both going to be presenting more evidence synthesis. They're going to be presenting systematic reviews, but they each take um, systematic reviews into a new direction, into uncharted territory. Um, so, um, without further ado, I should introduce, introduce Anami. So, yeah. uh, so Anami um, is based at um, Sussex University, um, is an agricultural and an education economist, um, has a lot of experience working in India and Sub-Saharan Africa, not just Malawi. Uh, and she said to me that she does theory-based field work or lab in the field experiment, so that's her specialism. Please welcome. Hi, thank you. It's really great to be here. As Hugh has introduced uh, the study a little bit, <coughs> so I'll be presenting some first results on an impact evaluation we have done of an agricultural extension service in uh, Malawi. Uh, these are the first results, so your feedback is most welcome. This is work joined with Hope Michelson at University of Illinois and the Rani at Cornell University. So as most of you guys know, agriculture extension, the goal of it is really is to relieve the information constraints of farmers. Essentially with the goal of encouraging them to uh, adopt new agricultural technologies, thereby essentially to improve their incomes and to improve their wealth. Now this is really important in uh, developing countries as most of the people there depend really on agriculture for their livelihoods. In Malawi where we are working, 70% of the population <coughs> depends on agriculture for their livelihoods. However, what we've seen in the last kind of 10, 20 years is when we evaluate these agricultural extension programs is that the evidence is very mixed regarding their effectiveness. It's quite variable, and some of them are even negative. They have, well, the negative impact, but from a cost-effective point of view, they were not worth the program, so to speak. And so this kind of leads us to our question, okay, so how can we now restructure these programs? These are programs that are currently under severe financial strain. Funding is being withdrawn from these programs. They are being restructured. So how can we restructure these programs in order essentially to get the most bang for our buck? So what are we going to do is we're going to take a learning perspective to answer this question. So we're starting from the basic observation that when you introduce a new agricultural technology in a community, what happens is that people don't really adopt it right away. What happens is that some people might adopt it, but most of them will hold off. It'll take a little while, and then maybe after five, ten years, some more petty people will adopt, and maybe after ten years, still not everybody has adopted. So essentially what you're seeing, and this is kind of a famous graph which was introduced by Rogers, an academic in the 50s, that this is really an adoption curve here you're seeing. And this is time, and this is the percentage of adopters, where some people adopt initially, some follow, and at the end, almost everybody has adopted, but not quite everybody. So what is this suggestive of? Is there some kind of a learning process? People are learning about the technology. Now they can learn from a couple of different sources, right? They can learn from themselves, they can experiment with a new technology, they can learn from others in the community, for instance other farmers, but they can also learn from experts. And it's this learning from experts that we're really going to study in this particular uh, paper. Then when it comes to learning from experts, as you guys know probably, there's a lot of different types of extension services out there. For instance, there's a traditional model which is called the training and visit model, in which an extension worker would go to a community, talk to a lead farmer there, talk about new technologies, and kind of hoping that this lead farmer will share this information with others in the community. There are demonstration plots you can set up, in which an extension worker Again, goes to your community and together with local farmers, picks a particular plot in the community and on that plot kind of cultivates maybe a new hybrid maize next to maybe a local maize and then throughout the growing season, farmers can observe these two different technologies next to one another and based on that, draw their conclusions. There are things like farmer field days where you could invite a whole bunch of farmers, this can be a thousand or something, to one particular location. This could be a demonstration plot in the village. It can be an agricultural research station would typically be done at the end of the growing season and farmers can kind of come there and the extension worker can kind of talk through the different technologies that were used to achieve uh, that particular yield. Now what strikes you is when you think about these different ways in which these technologies are presented to these farmers, they can have very different implications in terms of their learning. 
So the first point is that, as we know, of course, returns to agriculture are, is heterogeneous, different agricultural technologies. So it's heterogeneous, meaning that your returns to their technologies very much depend on your soil and climatic conditions. So what does this mean? It means that when farmers observe the result of an experimentation <coughs> on a plot that's known and familiar to them, it's going to be more meaningful to them. It's going to be more useful information compared to, for instance, if to observe a technology much further away, maybe in conditions that they're not familiar with. The second point is, of course, that these days, a lot of the new technologies we're introducing are fairly complex. And in order to achieve this optimal yield, you need to adjust your behavior in many different ways. You might have to adjust pesticides, you might have to introduce inoculants, you have to change the way you plant the seeds. You have to make a lot of adjustments. And this can be quite challenging for people. There's been a couple of recent studies on this, essentially where we interview farmers and they ask them about the optimal dimension and the optimal uh, dimension of different inputs. And we know now that farmers don't pay attention to all of them in a way, perhaps not necessarily optimizing along all dimensions. So what does this mean for an extension service? It means that when you introduce information, you have to think about the cost of information processing. How difficult is it for people to process this particular piece of information in the format that you've given to them? In that way, learning by doing might be quite effective. If they work on a demonstration plot together, they might recall that information better because they're effectively executing whatever they're meant to learn versus just telling them about technology. So that what we are going to do in this study, we're going to look at the causal effect of two very popular extension methods. One is demonstration plots, the other one is farmer field days. And we're gonna look at the effects of this on essentially knowledge of integrated soil fertility management practices. So these are the practices we're going to look at in this study. For those of you who are not familiar with these practices, these are practices, it's kind of a basket of practices meant to increase the fertility of the soils. They include a couple of different things. It ranges from optimal planting practices, organic, inorganic fertilizers, hybrid <coughs> seeds, other modern inputs such as pesticides, but also technologies like mulching. So it's really a basket of practices. Now, this is really important in the sub-Saharan African context where we know soil fertility is fairly low and declining, essentially, and these practices can be quite helpful. However, to date, the adoption has been fairly low. So this brings us to <coughs> looking at, essentially, the effect of this particular extension program on knowledge of these particular practices. Now, when we do this, we'll have to deal with some methodological challenges. The first challenge actually has to do with the fact that we need to establish kind of a good control group, right? If you look at the effects of something or something, you want to compare a group of farmers that has been exposed to that something to a group of farmers that hasn't been exposed. Now, in most extension programs, if they're rolled out naturally, they would typically be rolled out maybe in communities with either higher agroeconomic potential, or they might be targeted exactly to communities with lower agroeconomic potential, which makes them not quite comparable. Another thing that often happens is usually farmers are just kind of asked to volunteer and sign up for these things, which might result in a situation that only the most motivated farmers, maybe the wealthier farmers, are signing up for these things. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to develop a method kind of to, to create this control group. The second thing we're going to do in the study is deal with the fact, of course, that most traditional surveys, like the World Bank survey, etc., they wouldn't have information on knowledge. Instead, what you would have is you would have information on adoption, income, and wealth. Well, this is all good and well, but the problem is, of course, knowledge doesn't always lead to adoption of a technology, right? A whole lot of things can get in the way. Markets can get in the way, right? You might have learned about a new technology, but you might not have the money to actually go ahead and purchase this new technology. Or you might not have a market to go and purchase this technology. So because of that, we essentially are going to include knowledge in our data collection. So what are we going to do? We're going to have a quasi-randomized controlled trial with repeated quantitative and qualitative data collection. Quasi, I'll come back to the quasi bit in a minute, right? So quasi essentially means we were hoping to do randomized controlled trial, but it didn't quite work out. I'll tell you what happened and how we dealt with that. Okay, this is our setting, rural Malawi. I don't need to introduce this in this audience, right? One of the poorest countries in the world, 70% living in poverty kind of really at the bottom of this human development index. Now what is characteristic of Malawi, oh dear God, is essentially <laughs> that the majority of the people live on subsistence agriculture. I'm going to speed up. So subsistence agriculture, most of you guys know, um, the subsistence farmers are pretty much prone to kind of frequent droughts, pests in a sense, 
And as a result, this means that the incomes will fluctuate, right? So for these farmers, this integrated soil fertility manager is potentially a really good thing. It decreases their vulnerability and increases their long-term resilience. So this is really a good technology to introduce there. We work together with our partner, an NGO, Clinton Development Initiative, and we selected 250 villages in two sub-districts of Malawi. These 250 villages are pretty much all the villages in these sub-districts. We have a census of a particular locality. We divided these randomly in treatment and control, 125 in treatment. All the treatment villages are introduced to the CDI program and asked to form farmer clubs. Once this has happened, we went in with a baseline survey, a household level baseline survey, among 2,500 farmers. So you can count it's 10 farmers per village were randomly selected, stratified essentially by club member status. The program was rolled out through the growing season, and we went back at the end of the growing season, again interviewing this time 1,000 farmers. Okay. This is what this extension program looks like. These are people setting up essentially a demonstration plots. They're the main crops in the area, maize, soy, and groundnut, set up at the center location in the village. The CDI agent essentially visits the plot <coughs> regularly, but it's the farmer clubs kind of doing the activities. The farmer field days happen at the end um, of the season on two successful demonstration plots. Now, notably, the demonstration plot was only set up in 17 villages, which were strategically selected. So this is where the quasi bit comes in. So essentially, while all treatment villages were invited to the um, from a few days, only a subset of these essentially had the demonstration plot. We're going to deal with this particular issue using a propensity score matching at the end, kind of econometric technology, trying to deal with the fact that these demonstration plot villages might be different from the non-demonstration plot villages. A little bit on the data collected. As I mentioned before, we're going to collect information on knowledge. Essentially, we're presenting these farmers with like a test, like a school test, pretty much. Like we ask them, to answer many different questions about ISMM and reward them if they do well in this test. We also, of course, have the traditional questions on adoption as well. A little bit on descriptive statistics. Uh, quite a significant share of our households were female-headed. And note also the low levels of education there, only five years, and the fact that all farmers at baseline report to have issues with soil fertility, making our study quite relevant. Moving on to the analysis and results. So first, taking a look at the adoption data. So the adoption data we collected at both baseline and end of line. What it means is essentially we can, for each group of farmers, see how much they change from baseline and end of line. The first thing we noted is that all groups adopt more information, more technologies at end line than they do at baseline. So everybody improved. However, <coughs> the farmers in the demonstration club clubs improved considerably more than the others, essentially demonstrating an effect of the program. The effect side of this is 10%, which is not, not significant. Now, if you look at the different technologies, notably this was not the case for the farmer field days. So if you look at the different technologies, this is the farmer field days, where essentially on the left-hand side is the percentage points increase. And what you see for the farmer field days is essentially it's not statistically significant, even negative for soil. For the demonstration plots, it is statistically significant. So what this means essentially is that here, hybrid maize essentially went up, inoculation of soil went up, and the fertilizer tree practice went up after these farmers were introduced to this technology, showing an effect of the demonstration plot technology. So it seems like the demonstration plots were effective, but the farmer fields were not, just looking at the adoption data. Does this mean that these farmers in the farmer field days haven't learned anything at all, is that why they're not adopting? For that, we return to our qualitative data. Now we've interviewed these farmers repeatedly. Um, we've now been in for about six qualitative rounds. And when we speak to these farmers about what they've learned, demonstration plot farmers often talk to us about how this demonstration plot has changed their perceptions about the optimal yield or the yield they can achieve for soy and maize. And they also talk to us in detail about how they ca can use the technology. They talk about how to use pesticides, which type of pesticides, and what kind of other technologies they can use. They talk about inoculation, how to prepare the mixture, and how to apply it. In contrast, when we talk to the farmer field day participants, they use the word impressed. They went to the farmer field day, they were impressed by the beautiful crops there. They were impressed about the yields. But they didn't quite see that whatever they saw was applicable to them. They also said, well, clearly modern inputs are fairly important, but they were unable to decide which modern inputs exactly were important and how you should be using them. 
which led us to conclude and hypothesize that these farmers are learning something. There's a rational learning process, but it's costly and it's limited to what you can learn. The demonstration plot farmers, they are learning because what they see is relevant to them. It's within their villages on a plot that's similar to theirs. They can see it right away. The farmer field the participants visit the plot much further away, and whatever they see is not quite relevant. On top of that, the cost of learning is very different. The farmer field day participants have to learn everything in a matter of one day. That's really hard. The demonstration plot participants, on the other hand, have a full season to essentially learn the same thing by doing this, and as such, their cost of learning is much lower. Okay, so what we're doing is we're then checking basically the effect on knowledge. We're seeing, as expected, a positive effect on knowledge for the demonstration plot <laughs> participants. We're seeing some improvement, also some learning for the farmer field day participants, but it's fairly limited. And they focus on the technologies to them that poss possibly are technologies that are easy to adopt, such as mulching technologies and plant spacing technologies. But they're not learning much about the input intensive technologies. It's like they have only one day, so they happen to focus on essentially what they think is going to be useful for them. So our conclusion. Briefly recapping, so the smallholder farmers in Malawi have indeed low and declining soil fertility. ISFM would be beneficial, but adoption is low and the learning process is very much constrained. Now, does this mean we should toss away farmer field days? Obviously, it does not, right? The cost of farmer field days, as most of you guys know, will be much lower than the cost of demonstration. So it doesn't mean you should throw away the baby with the bathwater, right? It means that we have to re basically re-envision the farmer field is taking into account this learning process of farms. It means that whatever you're presenting to them needs to be, first of all, relevant to these demonstration plots in growing conditions that are similar to the farmers. Mention this at the start of your field day. Make it easier for them to learn. Give them learning to nudge them towards particular technology. So give them specific learning to. Finally, because we see that farmers are focusing on things that they're not constrained on, you might have to recouple back the extension with the input intervention, something that Malawi used to do in the 70s, they moved away from, and something that leads me to a second presenter who I think is going to talk a little bit about that as well. Thank you so much. This is going to be a whistle-stop tour of our uh, systematic review, um, looking at uh, agricultural input subsidies uh, programs in low and lower middle income countries. As you can see, um, like any systematic review, there was a big team from multiple organisations, Imperial College London, the Centre for Agriculture and Bioscience International, 3IE, just a few of them. Um, uh, I was working at 3IE when I did the majority of work for this, and this is a 3IE funded study. Um, very quickly, I'm going to uh, quickly provide a bit of background on agricultural input subsidies, very briefly go over our methodology and then try and focus on our results and findings, summarizing them very quickly. Um, okay, so the background, agricultural input subsidies. So uh, obviously this is just one fact about uh, the uh, nutrition uh, situation in, in the world. Um, in this kind of context, um, increased agricultural productivity can help address problems such as food security and uh, stimulate economic growth. Um, agricultural inputs, for example, seeds, fertilizer, um, new technologies, fuels, that kind of thing, can help increase productivity. And in doing so, it has the potential to uh, affect all sorts of uh, outcomes from uh, income to uh, GDP further down the line, perhaps. Um, uh, but these inputs are not always financially affordable or the kind of thing that farmers want to spend their limited money on. So uh, subsidy interventions aim to make those uh, inputs cheaper and make them available at below market cost so that they're more affordable to farmers. Um, so there's a debate about the effectiveness of input subsidy programs. Um, and the conditions under which they may or may not work. So that's why we wanted to do this systematic review. This is a edited version of our theory of change. I don't expect you to take it all in, but just to kind of explain a little bit, the kind of yellowy orange boxes are some primary outcomes that we wanted to explore. So whether uh, subsidized inputs increase production, uh, farmer revenue, uh, profit, income, that kind of thing. Um, but also, 
uh, it's possible that these um, programs might improve uh, economy-wide uh, outcomes. So the ones in kind of pink, things like the prices and consumption of staple crops. But also built into that, embedded in our theory of change, there are a whole series of assumptions. So um, most of these programs operate through a, a voucher system where farmers are given vouchers uh, that uh, in entitle them to reduced cost uh, inputs. So uh, we're assuming that these vouchers reach the farmers in the uh, amount they're expected to. Um, we're assuming that then the farmers use these vouchers as intended and that the inputs are additional to those that they would have used anyway. Um, very quickly on our methodology then. Um, it's a systematic review, so it follows uh, most of the steps that uh, a typical systematic review would. So we searched both the published and the unpublished literature, the kind of the typical databases in the field, uh, online websites, consulted experts, all the typical kind of phases that we'd go to to be as comprehensive as we could hope to be in finding studies. Um, and then we had systematic inclusion and exclusion criteria, so we wanted to look at evidence that told us something about farmers, workers, or consumers in lower and lower middle income countries, something about in input subsidies programs, and something that could tell us about our outcomes of interest. So for uh, the primary outcomes, earlier in the causal chain, we wanted to uh, find studies that employed an experimental or a quasi-experimental design, and for the secondary outcomes, uh, modeling uh, studies. So um, econometric simulations um, to uh, uh, simulate the way an economy might react to the introduction or uh, change in the rate of a subsidy. Um, those studies that we found through our search were screened uh, according to our inclusion criteria. We then extracted data to be able to attempt to address our research questions and uh, appraise the studies for their quality. Um, and then to synthesize them, for the uh, experimental and quasi-experimental studies, the meta-analysis, meta-regression analysis, and some qualitative synthesis of information that could tell us a little bit about um, implementation fidelity. Um, and for the uh, modeling studies, um, there was quantitative synthesis. Um, so this just tells you a little bit about uh, the, the search process and the studies that we ended up with. So the initial studies were screened and duplicates removed, and then uh, the vast majority of studies were either not about a context that we were interested in or didn't relate to an agricultural input subsidy program. That's typical for this kind of search. You, you know, uh, uh, the kind of databases that you're searching aren't that accurate, so you end up with far more uh, hits to begin with, and you have to weed them out until you get a far fewer level of uh, full text that you read then screened. Um, for their methodology um, and for uh, whether they looked at the kind of outcomes that we were interested in. And we ended up with 31 studies, 15 that could tell us about our um, primary outcomes of interest and 16 modelling studies that could tell us something about our secondary outcomes of interest. Um, just to give you a very quick summary about um, uh, where these told us about, um, they mostly focused on sub-Saharan Africa with a few about India and Indonesia. Um, the, uh, for our primary outcomes, most employed uh, quasi-experimental designs, and for the modeling, they were mostly computable general equilibrium models. And the programs that we were looking at were typically uh, programs that offered a voucher on a specific number of units of fertilizers and seeds, most typically, although some of these vouchers entitled people to free units. Um, very quickly then, uh, results and findings. So um, this is an example of uh, a forest plot that relates to the quasi-experimental and experimental <coughs> studies that we included for one of our outcomes of interest, so yield uh, or production. So the six studies on the left, um, they show uh, the, the points you can see, the boxes are standardized mean difference. Uh, with confidence intervals around them. The box size is related to the size of the study sample, so that's taken in a, into account. And the diamond at the bottom shows uh, the average uh, standardized mean difference, which in this case is uh, a positive small impact, so we can see that there was an impact on yield. I don't have slides for every single outcome, as you can expect, 
Um, so this next slide just shows um, the outcomes in general for our primary outcomes. So they're generally in the expected direction. So we see a positive impact on adoption and on productivity and on revenue, profit and income. Uh, there was only two studies that told us something about poverty and um, one had a positive finding as in a reduction in poverty and the other was um, uh, found no effect. Um, the evidence on implementation uh, from our quasi-experimental and experimental studies told us a little bit about implementation fidelity and showed us there are several points in the theory of change where problems occur. So farmers don't always uh, collect uh, the vouchers that they're entitled to. This is because inputs still have a cost that many of them can't afford, that they're handed out in locations that farmers might not be able to get to or they're not available at the right times for them. Um, inputs are not always used as, as intended. Um, in many cases, there was um, corruption that prevented farmers from getting uh, the vouchers in the correct amounts. So uh, vouchers were stolen. Uh, Farmers had to pay an additional bribe in order to access the vouchers. Um, and I guess the key finding that we can make from that is that there is a clear need for an increased transparency and accountability. Um, so there was also uh, farmers, when they actually got the, in the, the vouchers and the inputs, they sometimes shared those inputs. There was some elite capture within villages. There was some selling of them. Uh, and they were not always used on target crops uh, and um, subsidized inputs sometimes crowded out uh, the ones that farmers would normally buy. So it wasn't necessarily the case that uh, inputs were additional. Okay, so finally on our <coughs> analysis, for our um, modeling studies, um, we couldn't undertake meta-analysis because uh, this kind of uh, econometric model doesn't uh, include any uh, variance of the estimates. So um, what we've done is we've put together scatter plots. Um, this one is for consumption. So uh, you can, these, these models, they estimate different um, types of hypothetical subsidy programs. So an increase, a decrease, or the introduction of a subsidy or, or, or the removal. Hence, uh, on, our, uh, on the x-axis here, you've got the subsidy, and on the y-axis, you've got the outcome. Um, so the scatter kind of shows the relationship between the percentage of the input price subsidized and the outcome. In this case, it's consumption. Um, again, we did, we've, uh, the analysis includes scatter plots for each of our outcomes of interest and the narrative synthesis. But here, um, what, what I've put together is uh, elasticities, the average elasticity for each of these outcomes um, across our outcomes of interest. So these show the change in the outcome uh, of interest associated with a 1% change in the input subsidy price. Um, so largely, again, our simulation results show that uh, they follow our theory of change, though these are simulation models. They're approximations. They only show a small amount of uh, they only ca account for a small amount of the model variation uh, explained by a change in subsidy. So we're sort of seeing rather small changes here. Nevertheless, they're encouraging results. Just a few very brief conclusions then. Um, we see some positive results across primary and secondary outcomes. However, there is problems with program implementation, uh, with problems with both delivery and take up. Um, also, this review, it didn't provide any evidence on the, the cost effectiveness of input subsidies when compared to alternatives, and the majority of the evidence that told us something about impact, impact was focused on short-term impact rather than long-term impact, so that's something that we couldn't explore. The evidence base is Africa-centric and was limited uh, in its extent. I'll leave it there and we'll take a couple of questions. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks to 3IE for this invitation. Um, as uh, Hugh said, this was funded by 3IE and the Water Supply Sanitation Collaborative Council. Uh, I, I was part of a team with the Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Madras, uh, when we did this. 
Um, and, uh, oh, and an interdisciplinary team of about seven of us uh, worked on this review between November 2015 and December 2016. So um, setting the context to this um, review, <coughs> it's uh, the WASH and the MDGs. If you see uh, during the MDG period, the uh, <coughs> MDG 7 goal was actually towards improving access to water and sanitation. Uh, data shows that this has been achieved to a certain extent, but several people still lack access, and progress has been lopsided and not equitable or sustainable. So um, what does this mean? Uh, that 2.4 billion people still lack access to improved sanitation, and um, taking a quote from the Joint Monitoring Program report of 2012, the reason for this lopsided um, achievement of targets could be the act that information, we don't have sufficient information on what the axis of differences are, such as race, ethnicity, religion, and gender, which are often the, uh, which, are, which, are, which are often the avenues for discrimination, and understanding them could better reveal uh, the dynamics leading to differential outcomes. So this statement basically tells us that there are significant gaps in uh, the way WASH has been delivered during the MDGs. And as we all know, hygiene was not included in the MDGs, but it has been in, in, in included in the Sustainable Development Goals. So through a set of pictures, I'm going to try and take you through what the life cycle approach really is. Um, here we have uh, an old woman and a child both trying to access water from a public standpipe. And uh, pardon me for the rather graphic images, but a child trying to Risk, I mean, is risking life and limb sitting next to a railway track and defecating in the open. Probably a child from a very, very low income community or a slum where there are, are no access to toilets or the toilet is child unfriendly and unable to, uh, you know, it scares the child basically to use it. Adolescent girls walking really long distances to find a spot where they can relieve themselves, uh, which, which problems of which is, are exasperated when menstruation happens, where there's a need for increased uh, uh, privacy and also um, input such as water uh, to manage menstrual hygiene. Uh, a public urinal, where, which are used by men, men of different, um, you know, you have an able-bodied man, you have a, a senior citizen, you have a disabled person. Um, imagine the same scenario for women. Would women be able to use a toilet such as this? Um, and the lack of toilets for the transgender community. So it is, what is evident from this slide is that the need for wash is universal, that everybody has a need for water and sanitation and, uh, and hygiene and the need to manage it in, uh, with privacy and dignity. Uh, however, we find that wash service provisioning is sort of devoid of customization. And here is where the life cycle approach comes in and uh, how the life cycle approach can be used as a useful tool to study this gap. So the Sorry. So the human life cycle approach is basically to understand the challenges and disabilities faced by people across the lifespan. Um, nicely adapted by the Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council, where they say that all humans experience different phases in their own life cycle from infancy, puberty, parenthood, illness, and old age. And that all the and, and for programs uh, to be equitable, all these needs should be considered at all times. Uh, the life cycle approach has also been very successfully used in other disciplines such as health, social work, psychiatry, criminology, um, adolescent and child behavior, um, and violence. So the, um, what were the objectives? Uh, using the life cycle approach, we framed the objectives to identify the different population segments that were covered during the MG MDGs. Um, um, and also not just stop with that, but what were the different barriers that uh, these target segments faced, um, what were the strategies that were used to improve access, and what were the benefits that the target segments realized out of these programs or interventions that were targeted at improving uh, wash facilities. So apart from this, we also looked at uh, what we call the robustness of the linkages between uh, barriers, strategies, and benefits, and what were the conditions that led to the inclusion of a target segment in a WASH program or in a WASH policy. So the um, inclusion exclusion criteria um, are, of course, the sectors, water, sanitation, and hygiene between 2000 and 2015. 
so we looked at policy documents of uh, the, the countries that we finally shortlisted, which comes in the next slide. And we also looked at programs and projects that were uh, implemented during this period by uh, multilateral agencies, international NGOs, um, and uh, other um, smaller NGOs as well. So um, the um, life cycle, when, we, when I talk about life cycle segments, who were these segments? We had a total of 24 segments. We initially, uh, so which are in the life cycle category, we have children, adolescent, adults um, in the age category, and then we have senior citizens, we have disabled, transgender, and people living with HIV and AIDS. And we also have what we call the geographical and social segments, where we have rural, urban, poor and low income, migrants and pastoralists, caste and ethnicity, vulnerable by occupation, and what we call the universal access. So let me describe very briefly how we identified these segments. One, of course, is using the life cycle approach. We map them across the different elements of life cycle, which is age, gender, uh, disability, and so on. Um, but what we did was an initial review of documents, of policy documents and program documents uh, uh, on WASH. And uh, we found that uh, predominantly we found a lot of uh, documents targeting um, uh, urban, rural, poor, and low income. So we then said, and, and then there are differences where you know a rural program targets women, or a rural program has targeted children. So then how do we capture both these elements that have caused and uh, you know that have been used to deliver a service. So that's when we came up with the geographical and social segments. And uh, we also found that there were certain programs implemented towards the early part of the MDG period which targeted mainly only at rural. It was either called a rural water supply program or a you know a rural sanitation program. So the focus was largely rural and then maybe you know they might have mentioned a few life cycle segments. Uh, so we ended up having a combination of 24 segments in all. Countries included were um, in, in the African region, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Malawi, and Madagascar. And in India, we had Asia, uh, sorry, in Asia, we had India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. Oh, sorry. So um, the, um, uh, we, 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 we followed um, not just a search strategy, but we also did a sourcing strategy, um, simply because uh, Programs and project documents, as you know, we uh, as the discussion we had earlier in the morning, um, a lot of um, international NGOs uh, do not have their programs documented very well. So, uh, you know, what what I mean by that is, uh, it's very hard to find the proposal document, or it's very hard to find an appraisal document, or sometimes you have either an evaluation document, or you don't find completion reports. So what we did was we also wrote to these individual organizations whom we had finally identified. We also wrote to the different ministries which handle water and sanitation across the, across the selected countries, 11 countries. And uh, so we followed a search strategy as well as a sourcing strategy. Um, as you can see, the sourcing strategy didn't really yield much results because there, several people didn't even get back to us. Uh, and very few said that it's too, it, it's too time consuming to collate information over a 15 year period and send it across to us and that they didn't have that information themselves. Um, so this, uh, the data analysis techniques, we did a numerical summary because these were all programs. So therefore, the, uh, 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 we did uh, a simple numerical summary. What we also uh, tried out a qualitative comparative analysis to identify the different pathways because the information that they had were largely qualitative. Um, and we formulated something called a robustness index to measure whether there was any comprehensiveness between WASH policies and programs. So the overall results, we find that WASH policy formulation has actually gained prominence. Um, it's a, it's a no-brainer. But uh, in Asia, we find that it's picked up from 2004. And in Africa, we find that it's picked up from 2005, uh, probably because governments were preparing themselves to address the MDGs and in, in, in fo policy formulation and programs as well. Uh, the focus has largely been on universal access overall. Um, uh, the stated objectives are to improve access across uh, uh, rural areas or across urban areas. And within that, if you're lucky, there are mention of a few segments. Um, we then have uh, policies in water sector were the highest and hygiene the least. Um, programs on sanitation were higher during the MDGs. Um, MDGs, sorry. Uh, the sanitation sector also identified the most number of life cycle segments, and uh, the number of population segments identified in policies were higher than in programs. 
Geographical and, and social segmentation has been the dominant paradigm in WASH provisioning, and uh, I, I refer back to the community-driven presentation that was made uh, earlier that uh, you know, largely community-driven projects were, look, were, were geograph ge geography focused. So um, that is, that's what we see in WASH provisioning as well. Uh, and within that, we find that the primary target segments have been rural, urban, and poor and low income groups. Um, however, if we look at the life cycle segments, we find that women and children have been the most frequently identified segments, followed by adolescent girls, and adolescent boys find uh, a mention only in hygiene programs, which are very, very few. There are varied variations between uh, Asia and Africa. We find senior citizens have been given priority in um, Asia, whereas the disabled or physically challenged people have received attention in Africa. Men have been recognized in very few programs, and again, going back to the findings presented in an earlier presentation, the men have been recognized for their role as decision makers and also as managers of family budget. So when, uh, when uh, when a program is implemented, if a household toilet has to be constructed, their men are involved in that decision making because they decide where the toilet has to be constructed and whether the family has enough budget to be able to contribute towards even the cost sharing arrangement between the funder and, oops. Okay, um, so we find the transgender population is completely missing. Uh, we don't have any programs that have uh, specifically targeted interventions for the transgender. Um, so then we look at what are the barriers. Uh, here I'm going to need five minutes more. You have two minutes. <laughs> okay, okay. So in terms of barriers, we find that uh, environmental um, uh, adequacy and environmental barriers dominate. Uh, adequacy meaning the <coughs> lack of safe and child-friendly toilets at home, for example, number of toilet seats dedicated to children, and environmental barriers are locking, walking long distances um, uh, to access uh, wash facilities. Attitudinal barriers such as lack of awareness has also been highlighted in programs. Um, policy and institutional barriers find significant mention in programs and projects. Um, so which means uh, capacity of institutions implementing WASH as well as you know, uh, factors such as existence of high water tariffs um, to access WASH facilities. Uh, so what were the strategies? Um, we have, uh, we've, uh, pre I'm presenting a difference between policies and programs and projects simply because in, uh, in barriers and in benefits, policies and programs uh, uh, showed us very similar results, but here there is a difference. Um, policies have actually focused largely on beneficiary participation, uh, and then information education communication as a strategy to actually improve watch service delivery, whereas programs and projects have largely focused on um, uh, information education communication for the life cycle segment, uh, and even for the geographical and social segments. In terms of benefits, ensuring availability has been uh, and uh, improving physical accessibility have been uh, the large benefits uh, that a population segments seem to have derived out of the MDG programs. Um, and availability includes access at home and in public places. Um, we find that benefits uh, have identified have been identified the most for children, adolescent boys and girls, uh, whereas uh, Asian policies. Uh, we find that WASH benefits have targeted urban segments mostly. Uh, an interesting point is that, you know, though we find that benefits have been identified for children and adolescent girls, we find that barriers, uh, you don't find similar barriers being articulated for them. So in terms of a, uh, a, a sort of follow through between barriers, strategies and benefits, we find that there is a lot of dissonance in that. So you know, barriers for women would have been identified, but women have not been um, identified as beneficiaries at the end of the day in, in the benefits. Um, so African policies have, uh, pr have uh, focused largely on rural segments. So what have been the factors leading to inclusion? Uh, our robustness uh, index actually shows that uh, uh, higher scores for uh, geographic and so uh, social segments and uh, lesser compared to, uh, higher compared to that of life cycle segments, indicating a better understanding of barrier strategies and benefits for the geographical segment, or also possibly because it's been a dominant paradigm. Um, between Asia and Africa, we find that uh, Africa has a better robustness index value, which means that for the segments identified, they have provided, they have articulated the barriers, the strategies, and the benefits. Um, this is probably also because we find a higher involvement of multilateral and bilateral agencies in wash delivery in Africa. Um, the qualitative comparative analysis findings actually suggest that Asian countries with high human development index 
have a bet and better achievement of MDG targets are more likely to mention life cycle segments. So the role of the government as a facilitator and implementer is higher in Asia. And, a greater co and, and, and instances where there has been cooperation between multilateral agencies and the government has led to better inclusion of life cycle segments. So what, is the, um, what are the implications for policy and practice? This is my last slide. Um, so what we need is a shift in policy why we recognize that a one size doesn't fit all um, and that the WASH needs across life cycle segments differs. So what, it, what, it, what we're essentially trying to say here is that uh, uh, we need to sensitize policymakers towards this. And uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not new, it's not known, but it's just that it's not been mainstreamed into the way, in, into program design. Um, which leads me to the next uh, point, which is that a deeper understanding of barriers is needed, because uh, right now we see that barriers have been mentioned only for women and children, but it's not yet been articulated for other population segments such as adolescent boys or men um, or uh, the disabled or senior citizens. Um, and, and a deeper understanding of such barriers can lead to a better, uh, better, uh, uh, you know, uh, design of strategies. That strategies can be more specific. Um, and for this, we need to also have capacity building of policymakers and practitioners in in using the life cycle approach. And uh, and how is it that we can improve program implementation, uh, mainstreaming life cycle approach in the uh, national policies, missions, and schemes? And it's very much doable even within the geographical and social uh, paradigm that we see right now. Um, so one could look at uh, a service, a, a program that is looking at implementation of WASH in uh, a rural setting. But even within the rural setting, segment uh, the, your target beneficiaries by age, by gender, and all of that could lead to better um, uh, implementation and better access. Customization of WASH projects, and then improving the community demand for WASH, uh, empowering communities uh, you know, with the information on the life cycle approach and, and, and ensure that they demand for, pro for WASH facilities that, uh, that uh, cater to their needs. And uh, a better collaboration uh, between, a tri-sector collaboration between the, with, the, with the government, with the NGOs, and between practitioners for better impact and realization of the SDGs.